not changing. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Criswell. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Rochester, and today I will be talking about protecting FreeBSD with the secure virtual architecture. This is work that I did when I was a PhD student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And the work I'm going to be talking about today was joint work with Nathan Dottenhan and our advisor, Vikram Adve. Now, my dissertation work starts with a very simple question. Do you trust your operating system kernel? Now, <laughs> now here's the interesting thing. You say no, and yes, some people say yes, and some people say no. But in fact, in practice, we do. And the reason why is because on top of our commodity operating system kernels, such as the uh, FreeBSD kernel, we run applications. And we use these applications to process sensitive information. So we may buy things online using our credit cards from websites like eBay or Amazon.com. Uh, we may file our taxes, which includes uh, sensitive information, uh, such as if you're an American citizen, uh, social security number, and your address. Medical data. My doctor happens to store my medical information on a Windows machine. And certain voting machines um, run commodity operating system kernels or si operating system kernels based on them, such as Windows CE. Now, we run uh, these applications and on our commodity operating system kernels, but maybe this is not such a good idea. And the reason why is because commodity operating system kernels are vulnerable. Now, they're vulnerable for two reasons. First, um, all commodity operating system kernels today are written using C and C++, and as a result, they suffer from the same security vulnerabilities that applications suffer when there are coding mistakes that are made. So for example, commodity operating system kernels uh, have been um, uh, vulnerable to buffer overflows and integer uh, overflow attacks. Additionally, there are vulnerabilities that occur in operating system kernels due to their job as the operating system kernel. So for example, the operating system kernel provides the process abstraction, which is supposed to isolate different processes, different programs from each other. But sometimes logical bugs in the operating system kernel allow information to leak from one process to another unintentionally. So for example, through uh, misconfiguration of the MMU, one process may be able to access the memory of another process. Finally, all commodity operating system kernels to date are dynamically extendable. You can load new drivers, no load new kernel modules into the system as it is running. Now, because of how the operating system kernel is structured, these new modules, when they're loaded, can modify the operating system kernel behavior in arbitrary ways. And so attackers have taken advantage of this. They've written kernel-level malware, typically to hide their presence, such as hiding processes and files and network connections. But because they can use any arbitrary behavior that they want, they can do things like stealing data from applications, corrupting data within applications, even modifying application control flow. Now here's the real kicker. If the operating system kernel is exploited, then all security guarantees on your system are null and void. If your operating system kernel is compromised, you have no security on your system. And the reason why is because Nearly all security policies are either enforced by the operating system kernel itself, so if the attacker controls the operating system kernel, he or she can just turn the security policy off, or they are enforced by applications running on top of that operating system kernel. And so because monolithic operating system kernels have such a great amount of control over the system, they can just reach into the application, change its code, change its data, and therefore turn off the security policy enforcement within the application. So if the operating system goes, everything goes with it. Now there are two approaches to addressing this problem if you don't want to abandon existing commodity operating system kernels. So if you don't want to rewrite it, if you don't want to do massive restructuring and refactoring of the kernel. The first is to automatically harden the operating system kernel from certain classes of attack. And I've looked at this in my uh, PhD dissertation. Um, and built systems such as SVAM, which enforces strong memory safety guarantees on commodity operating system kernels, namely Linux. And then more recently, the Coffee system, which enforces a lighter weight security policy called control flow integrity um, on the FreeBSD kernel. Now, while these approaches are good, one limitation that they have is they only address a particular class of attacks. So the SVAM and Coffee systems, for example, address buffer overflow attacks and attacks of that nature. But they don't address things like 
kernel level malware that's loaded into the operating system kernel. They don't handle information leaks. They don't handle missing access control checks. So another approach that I explored in my dissertation is to just assume that the operating system kernel becomes comprom compromised. Just raise up your hands and say, OK, we're just going to assume that the operating system kernel can be compromised. Can we run applications securely on that kernel anyway? And so we built a system called Virtual Ghost, which provides data confidentiality and integrity for applications running on a potentially compromised operating system kernel. Now today in this talk, I'm going to talk about a little bit about coffee and Virtual Ghost. Most of the talk will be about Virtual Ghost because, in fact, Virtual Ghost is actually built on top of the coffee system. So we have control flow integrity for the FreeBSD kernel, and then we're going to build Virtual Ghost on top of that. And so the contributions of vir Virtual Ghost is that it protects application data confidentiality and integrity, as well as uh, protecting other features of the application. It uses compiler techniques. And because it uses compiler techniques, we can use the same processor privilege level as the operating system kernel. We do not need to use uh, hypervisor-based approaches, if you will, where we kick the operating system kernel up into ring 1 on x86, or have VMM extensions that allow us to run code below the operating system kernel. We can actually run alongside the operating system kernel. And it turns out that although we're using compiler instrumentation techniques to add instructions to the operating system kernel code, we are still faster than hypervisor-based approaches. So that's a brief overview um, of the research work. Um, I'll now talk about the design of Virtual Ghost and then take a small aside and talk about uh, some of the design and implementation of coffee. I'll then talk about our experimental results, so a little bit about the implementation and the experiments that we've run um, on coffee and Virtual Ghost. And then finally, I'll conclude with some future work that we're doing uh, at the University of Rochester. All right. What is the fundamental problem with current system design. The fundamental problem is that applications cannot protect themselves from the operating system kernel. So if I want to write an application that does not trust the operating system kernel, I will be inclined to write an application that just keeps its data encrypted as long as possible. So it'll encrypt data when it sends it to the file system or to the network. It may even keep data encrypted while it's stored in memory. The problem is that even if the application does this, it cannot protect itself from the operating system kernel. The reason why is the operating system kernel can access anything and everything on the system. So the operating system kernel can just reach in and read unencrypted data out of the application or modify the encryption keys to some value that the operating system likes. The operating system kernel can modify the application's code so that it just doesn't encrypt anything at all. It can even modify the application's control flow. It can stop the application, change its program counter, and then resume the application, causing it to skip over encryption and decryption operations. So no matter how hard an application tries on an existing operating system kernel, such as FreeBSD or Linux or Mac OS X, it just simply cannot protect itself. The goal of Virtual Ghost is to build a system that allows applications to protect themselves. And there are three features that such a system requires. First, applications require private data and private code. So they need, uh, they're still going to need public memory that the operating system kernel can read and write so that they can communicate with the operating system kernel. But they're also going to need memory that the operating system kernel cannot read and cannot corrupt. Secondly, they need incorruptible control flows. So they need to know that when they start execution, they start execution in their main function. And they also know that if they're interrupted by a trap or a um, interrupt or they uh, execute a system call, they have to know that the operating system kernel is not going to be able to modify their control flow maliciously while the operating system kernel is running. Third and finally, the applications that protect themselves are going to need a reliable way of getting their encryption keys from some file, typically the executable image, from that executable image into that private data memory region without the operating system kernel being involved. Because if the operating system kernel is involved in that process, it can change the encryption keys, it can read the encryption key values, um, thereby defeating the purpose of having the application encrypt its data when it sends it to the operating system to begin with. So these are the three things that we need. How hard could it be? Well, there's two challenges. The first challenge, the more obvious challenge, I think, is that modern processor design assumes that system software, like the operating system kernel, should be able to access all of memory. So that's challenge number one. 
But there's actually a more subtle challenge when you start trying to do this. The more subtle challenge is that if we want operating system kernels to provide the features that we expect them to have, they must be able to manipulate application state. It doesn't suffice to put an application over here and the operating system kernel over here and say, ne never the two shall meet. Because if you did that, the operating system kernel would not be able to create new processes and new threads. It would not be able to execute new programs by providing the exec family system calls. It would not be able to provide signal handler dispatch. Because all of these operations modify application state. They go in and make changes to the application's program counter. So instead of preventing the operating system kernel from manipulating application state, we must allow it to do so, but we must control what it does. We must ensure that it makes good state modifications, but not bad state modifications. All right, so we're going to need some infrastructure to do this. We're going to use from our previous research the secure virtual architecture. So in the secure virtual architecture, instead of compiling the operating system kernel down to native code, and instead of having inline assembly code written into the operating system kernel, instead of what we're going to do is we're going to compile the operating system kernel to a virtual instruction set. And we're going to design this virtual instruction set to be easy to analyze and instrument. Now, handwritten assembly code is not easy to analyze and instrument. So what we're going to do is we're going to port the operating system kernel to our virtual instruction set. We're going to have a set uh, of instructions in that virtual instruction set called SVOS, which we can use to replace inline assembly code. The SVOS instructions basically provide features such as registering interrupt and trap handlers, um, being able to configure the MMU, being able to manipulate interrupted application or interrupted program state. In this way, we could represent an entire operating system kernel in the virtual instruction set. The operating system kernel will have no inline assembly code, no handwritten assembly code in it at all. Now, you can't actually run a virtual instruction set operating system kernel. You have to translate it to native code like x86 or ARM or PowerPC or MIPS in order to run it on a real processor. Now, when I give this talk, some people tend to assume that, OK, you're kind of doing something like Java. So you have a virtual instruction set, you have a native instruction set. So the translation must happen in just in time, just like Java does. No. Secure virtual architecture is designed so that translation can happen any time you want. It can happen ahead of time. It can happen at system boot time, system install time, run time, um, uh, idle time. In our implementation, in our prototype, we implement translation ahead of time because A, it's easier to do, and B, it's more efficient. Now let's look at the virtual instruction set in a little bit more detail. It's comprised of two components. The first component is SVA core. SVA core is taken from the LVM intermediate representation. So it's the language that the LVM compiler uses um, to analyze and optimize code. Uh, it has type, source level types. It has explicit static single assignment form. These are things that allow us to do sophisticated compiler analysis and instrumentation on the operating system kernel code. Now, the SVA core instruction set is what you'd call regular computation. So it provides things like adding and subtracting, point arithmetic, uh, reading from and writing to memory, those sorts of things. Now, the LVMIR, if you take away the inline assembly code feature, uh, can't support an operating system kernel. You can't express the FreeBSD kernel or the Linux kernel in LVMIR. So we extended it with a new set of instructions called SVOS. These are operating system neutral instructions. We've used them with both Linux and FreeBSD. And they encapsulate the state manipulation and hardware configuration operations. So again, they provide instructions like configuring page table pages, uh, modifying interrupted program state for signal handler dispatch, um, registering system call handlers and trap handlers and things like that. Now what's interesting about is that not only do, do, they, do they encapsulate these operations, but because the operating system kernel has to use these instructions to interface with the hardware and to manipulate state at all, it allows us to control how the operating system kernel does these things. So we can control how the operating system kernel configures the MMU. We can control how it manipulates uh, application state. And so what we do is when we implement these instructions, these SVOS instructions, we add runtime checks to them to in help enforce the security policy that we're, also supporting, that we're also enforcing with the compiler instrumentation. So one implementation of the SVOS instructions helps enforce control flow integrity for the coffee system. Another implementation 
um, implements the runtime checks that we need for virtual ghost to protect applications from the operating system kernel. Now implementation wise what we do is we implement the SVOS instructions as a native code runtime library. So essentially what happens is you express your operating system kernel in the virtual instruction set. You then analyze and instrument it, convert it down to native code. The implementation of the SVOS instructions is missing from that native code. So the runtime library is linked in, provides the implementation of those instructions. You now have a complete native code kernel that you can boot on real hardware. All right. Now, how are we going to use secure virtual architecture to implement virtual ghost? How are we going to provide those three features that we need? Well, let's first look at private data and private code. So most operating system kernels, such as FreeBSD, uh, divide the um, virtual address space into two partitions, the user space partition and the kernel partition. So user space memory is where the application lives, kernel space memory is where the kernel lives, and the kernel is allowed to access both user space and kernel space, whereas applications can only access user space. Virtual Ghost is going to add two new partitions to the virtual address space. The first one is ghost memory. Ghost memory is memory that the application is allowed to read and write, but the operating system kernel is not allowed to read and write. So this is where the application is going to put its private data and its private code. Now what's going to happen is the, those, that implementation of the SVOS instructions, that runtime library, it has its own data structures that it uses in implementing its runtime checks. Those data structures should not be accessible to applications or the operating system kernel. So there's another region of memory called the uh, Virtual Ghost VM memory, or VM memory for short. This is where the SVOS data structures go. This region is not readable or writable by applications or the operating system kernel. So essentially we provide this new, the two new regions consecutive, uh, contiguously in memory that the operating system kernel is not allowed to read or write. Now by this time you're probably asking me, John, how do you keep an operating system kernel from writing into ghost memory and VM memory? The trick, the secret sauce, is software fault isolation instrumentation. So what we do when we're translating from virtual instruction set code to native code is we look for all the load and store instructions in the operating system kernel and we add some instructions before them. What these instructions do is they check to see uh, whether the pointer that's going to be used in the loader store is pointing into user space memory or kernel memory. If they are, it's fine. The pointer does not need to be changed. If they are erroneously, if the pointer is erroneously pointing into ghost memory or into the virtual ghost VM memory, then a simple bit masking operation moves the pointer into kernel memory. In this way, we are guaranteed that all loads and stores are either accessing user space memory or kernel memory but not ghost memory and not VM memory. Now, let's say your operating system kernel uh, unfortunately has a buffer overflow in it. An attacker could potentially use that buffer overflow to change the control flow to jump over these new instructions that we've added. And that would allow the operating system kernel to access ghost memory or VM memory. And that would be bad. That would violate the virtual ghost security properties that we're trying to enforce. So what we do is we use control flow integrity. By using control flow integrity instrumentation along with software fault isolation instrumentation, we can ensure that the software fault isolation uh, instructions are always executed. They can never be jumped over, uh, even if your kernel has a buffer overflow or other sort of memory safety error. In addition, the control flow integrity instrumentation helps protect the operating system kernel from buffer overflows and other related attacks. So we sort of get a two for one deal um, with Virtual Ghost in that we can actually protect the operating system kernel from attack and protect applications from the operating system kernel with one set of instrumentation. All right, so now we have our private data and our private code. What about secure application control flow? Well, why isn't application control flow, control flow secure today? The reason why is because on an interrupt trap or system call, the hardware transfers control flow to the operating system kernel, and the operating system kernel saves the interrupted program state on the kernel stack. The kernel stack is in kernel memory, it's in kernel space. The operating system kernel can just read and write that as it likes. So in Virtual Ghost, what we do is when there's an interrupt trap or system call, the hardware transfers control flow to the Virtual Ghost runtime library, that implementation of the SVOS instructions. That runtime library then saves the interrupted program state not into kernel memory, but into the Virtual Ghost VM memory. 
Then virtual go is transfers control flow to the operating system kernel. So now the operating system kernel can respond to the interrupt or the trap or the system call as appropriate. But now when the operating system kernel wants to modify application state, it can't do so directly. It's sitting in that virtual ghost VM memory where the operating system kernel can't touch it. So if the operating system kernel wants to make a change to say the program counter or the stack pointer, it has to ask virtual ghost to do it through an SVOS instruction. So in this way, the SVOS instructions can vet changes to save program state. And if the changes are OK, then go ahead and make those changes on behalf of the operating system kernel. So in this way, we can actually control operations such as signal handler dispatch, uh, thread and process creation, and the exec family of system calls. As an example, let's look at how the exec system call is implemented on a virtual system. So you have the operating system kernel. There's some application executable that it wants to execute. There's some program that has executed the exec system call, so it's been interrupted. And we are now running in the kernel code. So the kernel, sa kernel says, hey, virtual ghost, I have this application executable here. Please set up the code segment for this executable. And please change the save program state so that it, when I resume it, when I put it back onto the CPU, it will start up in the main function of this executable. So what Virtual Ghost does, it says, OK, I will go and I will set up the application code segment in the application's ghost memory. So now we have the application's code segment. It's in ghost memory. The operating system kernel cannot arbitrarily modify the application's code, but the application can use it. And then Virtual Ghost will locate the virtual address of the main function and change the program counter to point to it. And then it returns back to the operating system kernel. So when the operating system kernel does the return from system call, what will happen is the save program state will start executing this new application code in its main function. So what we've done is we've essentially taken the operating system out of the path, the critical path, um, where we rely on it to do the correct thing. Instead, Virtual Ghost does the critical operations of setting up the code segment and changing the program counter to point to the main function. All right. So now we have private data and private code. We have secure application control flow. The last thing we need is secure application encryption keys. So let's say you're um, an application developer. Uh, you've uh, written an application. You generate a public-private key pair for that installation of the application. And then you're going to run this on a virtual Go system. So if you just embed the application code and the application key into the executable file, and then you send that over to a virtual Go system, your operating system kernel can do one of two nasty things. The first thing it can do, it can simply say, well, I like the code, but I don't like that encryption key because I don't know what it is. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to replace it with my own public-private key pair. So when this application goes and encrypts data, I know what key it's using. Alternatively, the operating system kernel may say, well, I like that application public-private key pair. This application came with some files that are encrypted using those keys. But I want to be able to see what's in those files. So I'm going to change the code in the application so that it'll decrypt the data with that application key pair, and then I can see it. What we need to do is we need to tie the application code and the application key pair together so that if they are tampered with by the operating system kernel, we can detect the tampering and refuse to run the program. So every installation of Virtual Ghost will have a public and private key. The Virtual Ghost public key will be used to encrypt the application code, the application key, and then a checksum of the combined application code and application key pair will be encrypted with the Virtual Ghost public key. What this allows us to do is when the operating system kernel comes along and says, hey, Virtual Ghost, please set up the code segment for this application, Virtual Ghost can verify that the code has not been modified and the key has not been modified, and that, in fact, this code and this key actually go together. It's the right code and the right key paired together. If it hasn't been tampered, then what Virtual Ghost will do is it will set up the code segment, as we talked about a few slides ago, and then it will the, decrypt the application key pair and put that into ghost memory. In this way, the operating system kernel is never involved in getting that application key pair out of the executable and into the process's ghost memory. It's not involved in that process, and so as a result, it cannot corrupt that process. Yes? 
not sure if I quite understand. Are you essentially saying if I'm an application developer and I create one version of my application and I ship it, is it possible that I can send another version of the application? Yeah, I can send, uh, I can say, all right, let's use the old version of the application because that happens when I add something on the Right, right. Okay, so I think my answer to that is that um, if the uh, system that the developer is using is running on Virtual Ghost or if it's a system outside, so like it's like an app store from Apple or something, then that should not be a problem because the operating system kernel can't get in and modify that. It shouldn't be able to corrupt, it shouldn't be able to corrupt the process of creating the second, the second version of the application, correct? So, although I think, so I think there is an attack though where um, the operating system kernel so actually So I think what you'd probably want to do is I think what you'd want to do is every time you update an application, I think you would actually have to give it a new application key pair and then re-encrypt all of the files with that application key pair. So yeah, I had not thought of that. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I still have arbitrary code execution from the context of the process. I use batch TLT to macro-create it. Uh, I don't see any way to protect against that without having the entire everything. Uh, it doesn't even work. So, so, so let me rephrase your question. You're asking how does secure swapping work, right? Uh, so, okay. so, so, as, so, so as it stands right now, you can't swap out anything in ghost memory, right? The operating system cannot swap out anything in ghost memory because it can't read it and it can't write to it, right? So, so you were asking. So, you're, so first you said, so okay, let's say you swap out the code segment and the applicate or the application key pair, right? Well, the operating system can't do that because it's in ghost memory. Now, in the paper, we talk about a design for allowing secure swapping. So, if the op operating system kernel wants to swap out memory that happens to be mapped into ghost memory, it can do so. And what Virtual Ghost will essentially do is essentially encrypt the encrypt and digitally sign the contents and then allow the operating system kernel to have access to that. Uh, we haven't implemented that because we haven't run into a case where we need to actually swap uh, ghost memory and things like that out. I don't need so. to swap ghost memory, I just need to swap any memory that's in, the, in that process. So any executable memory. Executable memory should be in ghost memory because if it's not, yes. Okay. Because otherwise the operating system kernel can right. corrupt it. Yes. Uh, do you account for uh, modifications that might happen by uh, direct memory access? Yes. So we haven't implemented it, but that's easily solvable through IO, uh, through IO MMUs. So you just so you just can, so you have virtual ghost control access to the IO MMU, and the operating system kernel cannot reconfigure the IO MMU. So the virtual ghost runtime, the implementation of the SVS instructions, basically configures the IO MMU so that the operating system kernel can't use DMA to get information into and out of uh, physical memory that's mapped into the ghost memory region. So, um, you, what, what, what I don't really understand about this, um, if you can sort of re still affect the um, behavior of the whole system called the ghost process invoke, and you can also modify the trap frame. You can't modify the trap frame. Okay, but because, so the trap, the trap frame, what, what we call an interrupted program state. That's, sa that's saved into the VM memory, which the operating system kernel cannot access. So, or at least it can't access it without going through virtual ghost and virtual ghost. The interface to virtual ghost combined with this runtime checks ensure that the changes are not going to violate the application's control flow integrity. Excellent, excellent. So you have just reinvented the Iago attacks. So there is an attack called an Iago attack in which since the operating system kernel can't access the application memory anymore and it can't corrupt the control flow, it just says, I'm going to return bogus values from system calls. Uh, 
And when I do that, maybe I can trick the application into doing something it doesn't want to do. So maybe I return, inbound returns a pointer into ghost memory, and the, you know, the application just assumes that's OK. So um, in future work, I'm actually having a student work on that. So I will get to that in, in basically my last slide. But yes. Mm -hmm. by implementing at compile time all the on-memory exceptions. Yes. But are you even able to catch the kernel trying to patch itself to create the new memory exceptions at runtime? That's because we don't allow the kernel code segment to be writable, which I'll get to in a few slides. OK. Well, the kernel did try to catch itself, so you are doing OK. Yeah. So, so so, so in, in, in our USENIC Security 2009 paper, we have a solution for the limited amount of patching that Linux actually tries to do. So, but in general, the operating system kernel is not allowed to make arbitrary changes to its native code segment. Yes? Um, actually, so I haven't really thought about that. Um, I think user space is actually fine, and we'll get to we'll get to the reason why in a minute. All right, all right. I'm going to move on, and we're going to go to a coffee break. All right. So, coffee is essentially a subset of Virtual Ghost. So, coffee divides the virtual address space into three regions. It's got the user space region, the kernel region, and then the coffee VM memory region. So, this is the Virtual Ghost VM memory, just renamed as coffee VM memory. Coffee provides control flow integrity so that we know where we're jumping to in the kernel code segment. Uh, it gives us code segment integrity so the uh, operating system kernel code does not change. Uh, it gives us software fault isolation uh, on stores. So unlike Virtual Ghost, which has to maintain the confidentiality and integrity of VM memory, Coffee only needs to protect the, the integrity of its VM memory. So it only has to do software fault isolation and instrumentation on stores. Um, the SVOS checks that its SVOS runtime library does um, only uh, do control flow integrity and code segment integrity, and it doesn't have the uh, encryption key delivery feature or other Virtual Ghost specific features. So basically, coffee is what gives us the con control flow integrity and code segment integrity that Virtual Ghost requires, and then Virtual Ghost builds on top of that the features to protect applications from the operating system kernel. How does coffee work? Well, it could enforce the control flow integrity uh, in multiple ways. In our prototype implementation, what we do is we use the approach from Zeng, Tan, and Morset in their CCS 2011 paper. So what we do is in the, when we translate to native code at the beginning of every function and after every call instruction, we insert a special no-op instruction, a no-op instruction that does not appear anywhere else in the kernel code segment. Then we instrument all computed jumps, so every return, every indirect function call, to first take the address that the kernel wants to jump to and bit mask it so that it's not pointing into user space memory. So someone asked me, well, what about instructions in user space memory? Well, instructions in user space memory, um, their kernel code, the, the virtual, ghost ha virtual ghost has to set has to set up the code segment so that it's, I think virtual ghost has to set up the code segment so that it's executable. So I think virtual ghost still has to set up the code segment. But we allow arbitrary native code to be run in application space because we control what the kernel executes. So as long as the kernel is not tricked into running user space code, which is what the bit masking does, we, we're fine. So, so we bit mask the pointer, the address, to make sure that it's in the kernel code segment. And then what we do is we check to make sure that where we're jumping to actually contains one of these no-op labels. If it does, great. If not, then we use a direct branch to jump to some error handling code. Now for uh, returns from interrupts, traps, and system calls, um, so in modern operating system kernels, the operating system kernel can actually interrupt itself. So the operating system kernel can experience a trap or an interrupt while it's running. So just like application state, we save that state into the VM memory, where the operating system kernel cannot directly modify it. So in this case, we prevent accidental overriding through buffer overflows of changing the program counter um, of the operating system kernel when it's interrupted, um, or changing the privilege level of the operating system kernel when it's interrupted. Uh, we also have instructions that allow us to do the exception unwinding that's done on efficient implementations of copy in and copy out. So we can still use the MMU to catch uh, faults in copy in and copy out operations um, and securely unwind the control flow while being control flow integrity. Now, as I said before, we also provide code segment integrity. So by controlling the access to the page table pages and by controlling the MMU, 
Um, both Coffee and Virtual Ghost ensure that the code segment is never made writable. Um, there are never any changes that map new data or new code into the code segment. Um, there is an instruction that allows you to dynamically extend the code segment of the operating system kernel. So if you want to load, a say, a device driver, um, you can give Virtual Ghost or Coffee the um, virtual instruction set code. It will translate that down to native code, do the instrumentation, and then add that to the kernel's code segment. But otherwise, the operating system kernel is not allowed to make arbitrary changes to its native code segment. All right, back to Virtual Ghost. All right, so now moving on to the results. So we implemented a prototype of Virtual Ghost and Coffee for 64-bit x86. Uh, we ported FreeBSD 9 to Virtual Ghost. If you're wondering why it's so old, it's because we started this, I think, back in 2012. Um, so the trusted computing base is about 5,300 source lines of code. This is the size of the compiler passes uh, that, we, uh, that we wrote and the runtime library that we implemented. And then we modified several applications from the open SSH application suite to use ghost memory. So the SSH client, the SSH key, gen, key generating program, the SSH add utility um, use ghost memory for their heap. They really should be using it for globals and stack, but in our prototype implementation, um, we're only doing the heap. Um, and basically what they do is they create authentication keys that are encrypted so the operating system kernel cannot read them, cannot access them, but the SSH client and the SSH add utility can use them. All right, this is now released as open source software. Uh, we released the LVM compiler extensions, the Virtual Ghost uh, runtime library, and a patch to the FreeBSD 9 kernel code which gives you the port of FreeBSD 9 from x86 to the secure virtual architecture virtual instruction set. This is available on my GitHub account, uh, github.com slash jtcriswell with two L's. There's also a link to this from my uh, homepage at the University of Rochester. All right. Now, the first experiment that we ran was we wanted to see whether we could stop a sophisticated malware attack, and specifically one that was designed with Virtual Ghost in mind. So what we did is we wrote a malicious kernel driver. And what this malicious kernel driver does is it tries to set up a false signal handler within the application that will try to copy data between ghost memory to traditional memory. If it can do that, then it can just read the, the malicious driver can just read the data out of traditional memory. So if it can get a mem copy instruction to act as a signal handler, then it can steal data out of ghost memory um, by getting tricking the application into copying it into traditional memory. Now this is way more sophisticated than what you need for standard FreeBSD. In standard FreeBSD, there is no ghost memory, so you can just read data straight out of memory. So nevertheless, this works on native FreeBSD. It doesn't work on Virtual Ghost. And the reason why it doesn't work on Virtual Ghost is because Virtual Ghost is protecting the application save program state. When the application starts running, it tells Virtual Ghost through a system call that goes straight into the Virtual Ghost runtime library, here is where all of my signal handlers are at. So when the malicious driver says, hey, Virtual Ghost, please change the program counter to point to this mem copy instruction, Virtual Ghost says, oh, that's funny. The application didn't say that that mem copy instruction was a signal handler. So no, I'm not going to change the save program state at all. I'm going to leave it completely unchanged. So operating system kernel, if you continue to run this application, it's going to continue running right where it left off before the interrupt trap or system call. And so that's how we stop this rather sophisticated piece of kernel malware. All right. How does Virtual Ghost perform in terms of execution time? So we wanted to compare Virtual Ghost to other approaches. Other approaches try to magically encrypt um, application pages when the operating system kernel tries to access them, uh, the most recent of which is a system called InkTag. It uses VMM extensions in the processor. Um, we compared our LM bench benchmark results to InkTag. And what we found is that we do quite a bit better than InkTag. So Virtual Ghost is usually about 4x to 5x overhead on, uh, on system call latency, um, normalized to native whereas um, InkTag is more like 7x to 9x. Also, Virtual Ghost has very low overhead on some key benchmarks. So for example, on page faults, Virtual Ghost only adds 15% overhead, whereas on InkTag, you have 7.5x overhead. Now, this is not an apples to apples comparison because InkTag uses Linux, we use FreeBSD, we're using different uh, machines, uh, we're not even using the same version of the Ellen Bench benchmark suite, but it gives us a ballpark figure, and the ballpark figure says that Virtual Ghost is doing pretty well. Now, 
what about comparing virtual ghost to uh, coffee? So what we see is uh, this is our element benchmark results comparing um, coffee to virtual ghost. Um, because of the additional software fault isolation instrumentation on loads, virtual ghost does incur a fair amount more overhead than coffee does. So one thing that this tells us is that the software fault isolation instrumentation actually does matter. It is actually hurting performance. So if we could get rid of it, that would be nice. All right, now that's micro benchmarks. That's latency of system calls. Most applications do not spend most of their time executing system calls. They spend most of their time doing computation. So we wanted to see what is the effect of performance on actual applications. So what we did is we took two network servers, THTTPD and SSHD, and we ran performance experiments on them. Uh, we ran our experiments on an isolated one gigabit per second network. And the reason why we chose network servers is because unlike other standard benchmarks, like the spec benchmark, they spend a significant amount of their time in kernel space. They spend a lot of time actually using kernel services. And therefore, the overheads that we're adding to the kernel are more likely to show up. So our first experiment, we took THTTPD. We used Apache Bench to transfer files between one kilobyte and one megabyte in size. Uh, configured Apache Bench to use 100 clients, 100 clients app operating in parallel, doing 100,000 requests. And what we see is the performance overhead is negligible. Now, I haven't shown the coffee numbers, um, mainly because we configured Apache Bench a little bit differently. We used, I think, 32 clients instead of 100,000. But the results are essentially the same, negligible overhead for THTTPD. All right, that's multiple clients. What happens if what you want to do is you just want to transfer one file, transfer it over the network as quickly as possible, and use an encrypted connection so that no one changes your file or sneaks, on, sneaks up on the contents of your file during the transfer? So what we did is we took an unmodified SSH server. So this is not using ghost memory. This is an unmodified SSH server running on a native FreeBSD system, the coffee system, and the virtual ghost system. We use an SCP client on another machine to transfer files between one kilobyte and one gigabyte in size, and we measure the bandwidth that we get uh, through the verbo verbose mode on SCP. What we find is that coffee incurs 27, a 27 percent reduction in bandwidth in the worst case, whereas virtual ghost reduces the bandwidth by 45 percent in the worst case. So the overheads are not completely terrible, but obviously there's room for improvement. All right. Now, what happens if you use ghost memory? So, so far, these experiments have basically been showing what happens to existing applications if you put them on a coffee system or a virtual ghost system. What happens if you start using ghost memory? Is there any cost to that? So we took our SSH client, which is using a wrapper library that copies data between traditional memory and ghost memory when it wants to do read and write system calls. So we took this ghosting, as, ghosting SSH client and we ran it on a virtual ghost system. And we used it to transfer files from another system between one kilobyte and one gigabyte in size. And then we also tested the original SSH client. So this is original SSH and ghost memory SSH, both running on the virtual ghost system. What we find is that there's a 5% reduction in the worst case, typically for these larger file sizes. Why is it for these larger file sizes? Well, we suspect that overhead is coming from the fact that we're copying data between traditional memory and ghost memory when we're doing reads and writes. Now, here's the good news. The good news is that a lot of this copying is unnecessary because SSH is encrypting and decrypting data as it sends it to and receives it from the network. Encryption and decryption has an implicit copy operation. So what this SSH client is doing right now is when it receives encrypted data, it takes the data, the operating system kernel puts it into traditional memory. SSH copies it into ghost memory because that's what the wrapper library for the read system call does. Then it takes that encrypted data in ghost memory, decrypts it, makes another copy in ghost memory. So if we hand tuned SSH, what we could do is the encrypted data comes into traditional memory, then it's decrypted and copied into ghost memory in one operation. So instead of having these two copies, we only have one copy. So in a nutshell, while 5% reduction isn't bad, we think we can do better. All right, future work. So one of the things that um, we're going to have a student start working on soon is replacing and reducing the compiler instrumentation. So as, you, as you've seen, the compiler instrumentation, while it is better than using the VMM extensions um, in the way that Inktag, Inktag did, it still has overhead that's not negligible, at least on the Allen Bench benchmark suite and on applications like SSHD. We think we can replace the software fault isolation instrumentation using address-based identifiers or ARM domains, or perhaps we may making small modifications 
to the MMU of a processor to provide the isolation, that, isolation features that we need. If we can remove the software for isolation instrumentation, we should be able to significantly improve the performance of both Coffee and Virtual Ghost. A second thing that we're working on is we're working on defenses against Iago attacks. So someone here, I believe, mentioned Iago attacks. So Iago attacks, again, are attacks in which the operating system kernel returns bogus values to an application through the system call interface to try to trick it into doing something that it doesn't want to do. Our observation is that this is essentially an application trusting low integrity data. So by using standard programming language information flow techniques, we can basically check whether an application is doing um, computation on high integrity data and whether that computation is being influenced by low integrity data from the operating system kernel. So in this way, we should be able to build a system that formally verifies that an application is not vulnerable to these Iago attacks. We're also looking at the automated, we're also building a system that will um, automatically determine the efficacy of control flow integrity and code pointer integrity. So if you're following the control flow integrity um, literature, um, coarse grain control flow integrity, um, now there are now, sorry, there are now new attacks against coarse grain control flow integrity that allow attackers to compute to perform malicious computation. So we now have this open question of how good of control flow integrity do you need? So obviously, uh, coarse grain control flow integrity where you don't distinguish between different uh, call targets or different return targets uh, isn't sufficient. But if you use a more accurate call graph, is that good enough? If you have perfect control flow integrity, otherwise known as code pointer integrity, is that good enough? No one knows, and currently the only way that we can solve that problem is by having four graduate students trying out attacks, trying to create new attacks against these systems. My goal, and I have some NSF money to do this now, is to try to build an infrastructure that, given an application and, some, and a malicious computation that we might want to execute, can tell us, will this defense allow the malicious code, allow the malicious computation to be executed? Yes or no? And so in this way, we can have a much more systematic evaluation of our defenses. Finally, I have a Google Summer of Code student working on uh, producing a tighter call graph for coffee. So if you notice, coffee is using one of these coarse-grained uh, call graphs. So now, that's actually good enough for Virtual Ghost. Virtu it's actually better than what we need for Virtual Ghost. But if we want to defend operating system kernels from sophisticated memory, uh, sophisticated buffer overflows, then we're going to want something better than the coarse grain call graph that we're using today. And so I have a student that's working on implementing that for the coffee system. Uh, finally, because Andrew Tannenbaum did it, I thought I would do it as well. Um, just tell you a little bit about what we have at the University of Rochester. So at the University of Rochester, um, we have uh, obviously degrees in computer science. So we offer master's degrees in computer science and PhD degrees in computer science. Uh, we are very strong in computer architecture and operating systems and compilers. And I am now adding, um, along, with, uh, along with another faculty member, security expertise to our faculty. In addition, uh, you might want to know that we have a new master's program in data science. So if you're interested in big data and being able to study big data along with some sort of application area, we now offer a one-year master's program in that. Uh, we have a small department with small class sizes. My operating systems course uh, has about 25 students. That's both undergrads and grads. So there's a lot of personalized attention from our faculty. And if you like doing kernel programming, you get to do that in my operating systems course. So something to think about if grad school has been on your mind. So in summary, we built a system called Virtual Ghost. And Virtual Ghost permits applications to protect themselves from a commodity operating system kernel. It uses compiler techniques, namely control flow integrity and software fault isolation. And this keeps higher processor privilege levels free. So we don't need the processor to have VMM extensions. Uh, we don't have to use them so they can be used for something else. And it turns out that by using compiler instrumentation, we are faster than current VMM-based approaches. With that, I'll take questions. Yes? So one of the reasons why I wanted to present here was to gauge how interested people are in this technology. So, and one of the reasons for that is because being a small, small school, I have a small research group. So I have limited developer bandwidth. So you tell me. Is this something that's interesting? Does it sound too wild and crazy? What do you think? 
<laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean I didn't I didn't mean to put you on the spot. When I said you, I actually meant all of you. <laughs> Yes? How much work to support other architectures? Support other architectures? Um, good question. So basically what you would need to do is you would need to port the SVOS uh, uh, runtime library um, to another architecture. So you need to rewrite that. Um, if you design, if you port it to the virtual instruction set properly, um, then it, that's probably about all you need to do. Um, sadly, that is not what I did in my research prototype because I was in a hurry and kind of learning the low-level parts of FreeBSD as I went. So um, I probably didn't actually, so I basically what I did is for the virtual instruction set port, I didn't create a new port because that was more work. What I did is I took the x86 port, ripped out the x86 port parts and put my virtual instruction set parts in. So, but if you do it right, then you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to worry about that stuff. And again, it's only about 50. You also have to port the compiler parts. But again, this is only 5,300 lines of code. So it shouldn't be a lot of work. So, so as far as adoption among the BSD, I mean, one, one of the, it seems to me like one of the barriers to entry here is that I really take advantage of the challenge of making the changes in a way that you don't feel like you're programming, you need to say you're programming, which then makes it harder to um, maintain parity with other operating systems Right, so, so to answer that, it's, you're correct. Um, one of the interesting things is that, so like for mobile applications, I think we can actually use automated compiler transforms to take existing applications and transform them into versions that protect themselves. For uni regular, regular Unix applications, it's more difficult because we don't know which files are supposed to be shared and therefore not encrypted so that everyone can see them and which ones are supposed to be encrypted. So. Um, it is possible, I think, though, to create an API that the program just compiles to, and then on systems that support Virtual Ghost, they do the whole encryption, uh, encryption thing, and then on systems that don't use Virtual Ghost, the encryption is just a null operation. It's attacking, it's attacking a similar, sim similar problem, or rather, SGX is starting to attack the same problems that we're attacking. So the, SGX, the first implementation of SGX, SGX1, was primarily designed to take small bits of applications and throw them into what they call an enclave, this isolated environment. And so to make things simple, they, or maybe not simple, but to provide the security guarantees they want to provide, they did simplifying things like code and enclave can't execute system calls. So, you know, code and enclave, for example, can't receive a signal, can't have a signal handler. Uh, signal handler. Um, it can't do system calls, so it can't do read and write. Whereas in virtual ghosts, they can. Now, my understanding is that the group at Intel is starting to develop a new version of, of SGX called SGX2, which tries to fix some of these limitations because they're wanting to do what virtual ghosts can do, which is to protect an entire application. Um, I'm not familiar with exactly what they've done and how far they are on that, but I know that that's what they're trying to do. Yeah, so, so, so I think you're talking about Haven from OSDI. Yeah, so one thing about Haven that they've done is I think they're trying to protect the application from the hypervisor. And what they've done for the operating system kernel, they've said, okay, we're just going to use a libOS, and so the OS is now part of the application. Well, that works, but that's not a commodity operating system kernel, right? <laughs> 
that's a library operating system. So. Yes? Speaking of libraries, what do you do with uh, dynamic libraries? Ah, so we have not investigated dynamic libraries yet. Um, I think that it would be simple enough to, sim to, ver to use cryptographic signatures so that when you, when, you, when, you, when you ask for a dynamic library to be loaded, you can actually verify that it is the correct library to be loaded, but it's not something that I've actually thought about in detail yet. Yes, ptrace does not work. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So, so specific. <laughs> so, so yes. Yeah. So, in a cloud server, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to be able to isolate. First, first of all, in any server system, right, or or any server in which you care about security, you want to isolate applications from each other, and you want to isolate them from the system software because system software can be buggy. And in particular, the way that we build commodity operating systems, they're very large, they're very complicated, they're very privileged, right? But in addition to that, on a cloud computing system, what you'd want to do is you'd want to protect it from the hypervisor and from other virtual machines, right? Because you don't want other, you know, other people running on the same physical piece of hardware to be able to access your data or corrupt your data. So yes, it's very, it's, it's very relevant to that area. Um, one interesting piece of future work that we could do is to look at extending the virtual instruction set to support a hypervisor. And that way, protect from, you know, basically protect applications not only from the operating system kernel, but also from the hypervisor and other virtual machines that could be running on the same hardware. So, this is a technical one, but uh, you know, prevent the likes of, instead of something that's just substituting in something else that's down here. So, it just has to get slightly confirmed. So, 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 in, so, in other words, when you execute a program, how do you know it's the right program? So, well, okay. So, so first off, the question is, is can the operating system kernel corrupt the application code? And the answer is no, because of, because of what I showed earlier, where the application code is encrypted with the virtual ghost public key, so only virtual ghosts can decrypt it, so forth and so on. Now, the second question is, is let's say that you want to execute program foo. And the operating system kernel says, I like program bar better. So it executes program bar. Now you want to talk to, say, program bar over a pipe. How do you know that it's, or you want to talk to foo over a pipe? How do you know it's foo and not bar? Well, that's why, the, that's why I said with the application key pair, that's why it's a public-private key pair. Because if you know the application's public key, or let's say you have a digitally signed certificate, where you know, okay, this is the public, you know, this is the public key of this application, if the operating system kernel starts up another application and you start talking to it, you can actually authenticate that the application you're talking to is the one that you want. So if you know foo's public key, then you can, when you, if you're talking to bar, bar won't be able to authenticate itself as foo. Okay, so basically, if I set it to command line and type execute key then, and the service and the kernel bar are compromised, I will have to somehow check that I'm writing the command line directly so I have to dump the signature. Right. So now, now in the case of SSH key gen, what's going to happen is, like, let's say the operating system kernel runs another application. That application is going to have a different public-private key pair, right? Because the operating system kernel doesn't know what your SSH key gen public-private key pair is. So if you then run your SSH client, it's not going to be able to use the authentication keys created by the operating system's SSH key gen because it's not going to decrypt properly, right? All right. Now, there are issues with, OK, if I'm the user and I'm actually typing on my keyboard, how do I know that the application I'm talking to is the right application? How does the application know it's talking to me, the user, as opposed to like some other program that the operating system is set up to masquerade as the user? That's an open research question, um, which I have a few ideas for, but um, that's definitely future work. Yes? So, um, you, you mentioned like, um, so the application is running for security reasons, um, but there's no way to confirm for security requirements um, because the key is only known by the not hypervisor, but like what's, what's the term again? Uh, virtual go the, the yeah, vir virtual, virtual ghost. ghost. Yeah. But um, I mean, when the kernel loads, starts up, and virtual ghost is like a component that's within that kernel, right? Or it's virtual ghost running on the outside. I, I mean, is it really the case that at no point in time did the kernel actually know the secrets or key? I mean, so so if you have so. In a complete implementation, 
including, including one that can dynamically load new kernel code. What you would have is your bootloader. You'd use Trusted Boot to make sure you have a bootloader, which loads Virtual Ghost, which loads the operating system kernel, which then can start up applications. So, you just so if you if you if you corrupt the the processor, the actual hardware, then um, no, we don't defend against that. That's not in our attack model. So um, yeah, you're you're definitely you're, you're definitely you're definitely uh, cooked then. So how would this model protect against some of the key loggers? Key loggers? Uh, okay, so. I think Virtual Ghost provides the infrastructure to protect against something like key loggers, but we don't actually have that implemented because then, then what you're talking about is, okay, how do you use these features? And that becomes, it's, that becomes a whole bit more research, right? So one way to potentially do it is to have, a, essentially to have a kernel driver that's trusted. So what you do is you create kernel drivers that can have ghost memory. And if you can do that, then an application, when it starts talking to a driver, can actually authenticate it. So basically, you have a few drivers that Virtual, that virtual Ghost gives keys saying, OK, this is the driver for the keyboard. This is the driver for the screen. So applications can basically get the, their public keys from Virtual Ghost, authenticate them using those public keys, and then talk to them over an encrypted channel. That's one, that's one potential way that you could do it. But that, that sounds almost like Linux stuff. Um, Yes, but not to the same extreme because you don't have your file systems and you don't have your networking subsystem and all that other stuff um, um, built as isolated drivers. And more importantly, what I would like to do, so, so this is something that I've been thinking about, is I would like to keep these drivers in kernel space because I don't want to I don't wanna have to run, I don't wanna have to run them in user space. So, and that's an, additional, you know, that's an additional challenge of you know, can we actually do that? So I think the answer is yes. But. Well, so 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 the, so the thing is, is that what you what you have so in order to build a complete system, like an end-to-end -end system, you have to deal with issues such as how do you know you're actually talking to the user through through a real device? Um, how do you authentic? You know, when you, you when you rely upon another piece of software, how do you verify that it's doing what you want it to do? And I think that there are solutions to those. Um, you know, proof carrying code might be useful, or just using public-private key encryption, where applications are actually authenticating each other as opposed to just trusting each other like they do today. But yes, it's an open problem. It's not clear exactly how to solve them or what the best way is to solve them. Yes? So to your question earlier, uh, there is always considerable interest in the 3D preview of the on-screen issues. Um, and then this is certainly one of them. Uh, have you uh, been able to analyze approach with all the other security measures that are already in the, in the previous two uh, families, uh, jails, uh, CAPSA code? Uh, they are addressing completely different issues. So what Capsicum is doing and what jails are doing, containers and all that stuff, is that they are isolating user space applications and they're trusting the operating system kernel to implement this correctly. So, And it's a very valuable thing to do, I should add. I used to build mandatory access controls to do this. Um, you know, probably about 15 to 17 years ago. So now, okay, that's a long time ago. Anyway, so that's a very good thing to do. 
However, it's trusting the operating system kernel. And what I found when I worked for Argus Systems Group, which you know, made extensions to Solaris and AIX with these mandatory access controls, is that when attackers couldn't attack applications, they attack the operating system kernel. And the operating system kernel, it's, it's, it violates all the security design that we know we're supposed to be doing. It's large, it's monolithic, it's overly privileged. You know? And so what my research work has focused on is trying to address this challenge, the fact that the op commodity operating system kernels are not designed properly. They're susceptible to buffer overflows. They're susceptible to rootkits, so forth and so on. What can we do about it? So, so basically, it's orthogonal problems is what it is, I would say. OK. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, if you have any uh, other questions, uh, please feel free to come by and chat with me. Thank you.